Good evening, good afternoon, good morning from wherever in the world you are. It's my pleasure. I'm Jeff Wyatt hosting the 17th annual Party Mad, a little different this year with COVID. Uh, we have in these unprecedented tumultuous times, you know, where planet Earth's uh, life support system is being degraded, we have three speakers who are going to, um, they're expert speakers about Madagascar and conservation, and they're going to describe their collaborative partnerships between Seneca Park Zoo and their programs. It's all about our interconnectedness. First, I have a speaker is Charlie Welch. I've known Charlie for quite a while. He's at Duke University, the Duke Lemur Center. He's the conservation coordinator there. He's been able to connect the university there with impactful conservation in Madagascar for over three decades. We have a video that we'd like to show you, and then we will uh, have a conversation with Charlie. All right, everybody, before we get started with the video, I do just want to go over some basics of this webinar. If you are not familiar with Zoom, um, the first thing I'm going to let you know is that anybody who's in the room right now, we are not able to see or hear you, but we do have two other ways that you can communicate with our panelists and our wonderful moderator, Jeff Wyatt, tonight. You can either use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. That's useful for making some casual comments throughout the event. And if you have a specific question that you definitely want answered by our panelists that you see throughout the evening, you can go ahead and use that Q&A function. And we are planning to have at least some time at the end of the event to answer our questions. So on that note, um, I am going to get started with our first video from Charlie Welch. Hi everyone, my name is Charlie Welch. I'm the conservation coordinator at the Duke University uh, Lemur Center in Durham, North Carolina. And today I'm gonna to talk about our Sava Conservation Project in Madagascar, where we uh, work with the Malagasy to try to protect uh, both forests and lemurs. Um, Here's a, uh, most of you I think already know what Madagascar looks like, but this is just to give you an idea of the different um, biomes or bioclimate regions. There's wet forest, there's dry forest, there's even spiny desert. But our project is in the Eastern wet forest and it's called Sava Conservation just because that's the region that it's in. And the Sava region has two um, major protected areas, a national park and a reserve, um, which we work intensively with and in the region around. The area in that part of the country is pretty much what you imagine jungle to be like, two to three meters of rain. When I say three meters, that's up to over nine feet of rain a year. Um, high elevations up to 6,000 feet, uh, really severe topography. And this is actually Marajeji National Park from the side. But you get an idea of here looking at this image of just how um, degraded the landscape is, the lighter green around the protected areas. And that's a big reason that we're, we're working there. The area has an array of, of lemurs from the silky shafak, which are quite endangered, to the uh, red-bellied lemurs, white-fronted lemurs, some very rare and uh, unique species of birds in the area as well. But a lot of people and a growing population, the population in Madagascar overall is growing by about 3% a year, which doesn't sound like much, but is, is quite fast. We've been working in the region for almost a decade now. Um, we have a very small team of Malagasy educators, and uh, up on the upper right is on, um, Lantu Andriana Andrasana is our project manager, and on the left is James Herrera. He's the program manager and these guys keep things going on the ground. 
our uh, approach or strategy to working in the region to conservation is to try to protect forest. And we've learned that the best way to do that is, is through working with the communities. Madagascar is a very poor country and um, people are just trying to grow enough food to eat. So, so you really have to work through the communities if you want to uh, protect forest. So, our most important activity is environmental education. We're involved in teacher trainings. We work with the local school district in training teachers in how to teach environmental education. We get um, students out into the forest on guided tours, and this is where Seneca Park Zoo has been such a great help to us, helping support students at uh, uh, visit of what's called the Makolin Reserve in Antala in the Sava. Um, but it just has a very high impact activity getting these students into the forest with guides that really know the forest and can explain the forest ecology. Festivals we sponsor and, in, and are involved in, it's a great way to get young people excited about, about the environment. Reforestation is another one of our important activities. Fish farming we've been involved in to get uh, a different source of protein to people in, in place of uh, bush meat and wild meat. We've been looking at changing also or helping people cultivate insects and which is already a very popular food item for people. We've supported uh, yam production as a, an alternative farming. And one of our more important uh, activities has been in sustainable agriculture and we're doing trainings now in what's called permaculture or regenerative agriculture. We support fuel efficient stoves which use less wood Family planning, population pressures on the forest are very important. We're trying to, to give women who want reproductive choices to give them those choices. We work with Madagascar National Parks, um, supplying them with raincoats, helping them protect the, air, the, the national park and reserve. We work in uh, uh, support research, do research ourselves. The Sava is a relatively unknown region. We collaborate very closely with the local university. Um, we're very proud about that and, and are pulling university students, Malagasy nationals, into, uh, into our forest ecology work, but also our regenerative agriculture work. We're involved with Duke students. We're a part of Duke, so we have uh, different Duke organizations that collaborate with us to the benefit of both. But as you can see from, from, from what I've said, our, our project really revolves around um, working with the local people. And uh, we feel like if to achieve a long-term sustainable conservation that, that you really have to convince the local people that forests are, are, are worth protecting. And that's all I have. And I just would like to thank uh, Seneca Park Zoo very much for the support of our environmental education. And uh, we really couldn't do what we do without uh, loyal supporters like, uh, like you. Thanks very much. Charlie, thank you. No, thank you very much for what you are doing. Seneca Park Zoo is proud to support you, and we hope that our local and global participants in this webinar uh, join us in thanking you and supporting your work. We are most impressed with your capacity building and how you're transforming lives in the communities. But I do have a question. We know that your program has links with the government. And could you uh, enlighten us a bit about how your activities and your initiatives working with the government have uh, made a difference for the local communities? 
Um, we do, as as mentioned in the talk, we do do um, um, collaborate with the Madagascar National Parks, who is the government entity that that manages the the parks and reserves, and their budget is very limited so we help them with protecting the the national park especially um, but it, as as was mentioned in the powerpoint also that that um, we have been supplying them with raincoats and and boots the guards that that work from villages on the periphery of the reserve or of the national park that uh, interdisciplinary collaborative approach with government and as well as between your academic institutions is making a real difference. Uh, I think we'll move on to our next panelist so that we can uh, save time for questions near the end from those participants. Our next panelist is a friend of mine, Dr. Eric Patel. Uh, Dr. Patel is a world-renowned lemur biologist. I first met Eric about uh, 20 years ago or so in Rana Mafan and uh, we're both all grown up now, I think. Uh, we will um, st start with a video with Eric and uh, follow up with a question. In Mayaka, you'll find alligators, panthers, and lemurs, certainly not in the wild, but in a lemur conservation foundation. So can you, can you tell our viewers uh, what is a lemur? So a lemur is a primate that's only found in Madagascar. Um, a lot of people know the iconic ring-tailed lemur, but there's actually over a hundred different species of lemur. Um, and they range in size from a tiny mouse lemur that it's about the size of my hand um, to a now extinct lemur that was actually the size of a gorilla. Oh my gosh. And how many different types do you have at your... Um conservation area? On, we have on six, six different species at okay. the reserve. And, and how many lemurs? We have 56 wow. individuals, okay. yes. And how, how old do they get to be? I mean, how long can they live? What's their life expectancy? It depends on the species, but the median life expectancy for a lot of the species is about 20. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of the Lemur Conservation Foundation, its programs, and what got you involved? Sure. So the Lemur Conservation Foundation was started in 1996 by Penelope Beaudry Sanders. Um, and she was leading a, a group to Madagascar with the American Museum of Natural History mm -hmm. um, with Dr. Ian Tattersall, who's a famous paleontologist um, and lemur expert. And she was just completely blown away by the lemurs and the biodiversity, but she was also really alarmed by the alarming rate of habitat destruction and the imminent threat awesome. to the lemurs. Um, so she decided to start um, an organization that was dedicated solely to saving lemurs from extinction. Which I know they're, they're very close to extinction. Uh, extinction. If your, your website was correct, it said there's only 14% um, of lemurs um, still thriving in the wild. Yeah, Is that? Eric's going to talk a little bit about okay. that too okay. later, but the, the numbers are, are definitely are great. Yes, Eric, Dr. Eric, can you please tell us, I mean, why yes. is it so important to save them? Because mm -hmm. I know that yeah. there's... Well, lemurs are both very, very rare and very unique. Mm -hmm. um, like we were talking about, um, all of the lemurs are threatened by deforestation, human hunting, and selective logging. Mm -hmm. um, it's now recognized that lemurs are among the most endangered group of animals in the world, and roughly 90% of them are threatened with extinction. Um, a quarter of them are what mm -hmm. we call critically endangered. So mm -hmm. about at least 25% of 25% of all of the hundred odd lemur species. Um, really face imminent um, extinction risks uh, in the in the short term. Okay. Now, what are you doing in Madagascar to help save them? Well, we have five major projects: uh, field research, ecotourism, environmental education, reforestation, and community development. Um, field research: we work with um, Malagasy students, so we're involved in training of local guides as well as university students, trying mm -hmm. to promote the next generation of conservationists mm -hmm. in Madagascar. Okay. Um, one of our students now is working on a population survey to improve our, our counts, uh, our census of the number of lemurs remaining in, in the main reserve that we're focused on called Anjanahari Besud Special Reserve 
or ASSR for short. Okay, and you can go there on an eco tour, right? Yes. It went on your website. In fact, we've just developed a new tourist campsite called Camp Indri. And it's um, deep in the reserve with very nice accommodation, tent shelters, beautiful dining area, quiet picnic areas near the river. And uh, that's, we hope that will become a popular tourist destination I, in the I years would, to come. I would love to go. So what are some of the uh, projects that you have coming up for your conservation area? Well, we, uh, last year we just started a three-year Leap for Lemurs campaign to raise funds for some reserve enhancements um, to keep up with our growing uh, lemur population. population. Yes. Um, and CLR Designs um, generously donated plans for a third lemur forest. Um, so out at the reserve, we have these very large forest habitats, um, which is a really enriching environment for the lemurs, but it also allows mm -hmm. us to study their um, natural behavior, and we also have scientists that come out um, and study lemur behavior as well. Um, so another a forest, another lemur shelter, and a clinic and quarantine. And we're really happy that at the end of the first year, um, we've already raised half of the funds um, okay. for our goal, which means that we can um, increase the much needed space for the critically endangered lemurs. Awesome. Well, thank you yeah. so much. There's so much more to Absolutely. hear. Um, again, our viewers can go to your website and find out more and find out what they can do to help you. And thank you for you know, being advocates for these poor little creatures. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you as well, Eric. Uh, the uh, Lemur Conservation Foundation has a an amazing facility that I've been fortunate to visit in Mayaka City. You know, it's it's rare that you see a facility that such a strong has a strong learning component, and it's also an AZA accredited institution. Uh, we're very proud to have you as a member there and, and most uh, proud to support your research. Could you tell us a little bit about that, that Lemur Conservation Foundation and the important work that's happening there in Florida that's actually making a difference for lemurs in the wild? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of our most uh, effective managed breeding programs is the Mongoose Lemur Program, where we actually have the largest population of mongoose lemurs in the world, and that's a critically endangered species. And I was looking at lemurs of Madagascar just the other day, and in 2008, mongoose lemurs were only listed as vulnerable, but now they're critically endangered. Their populations have really crashed in Madagascar. And we also support mongoose lemur work in Madagascar, as well as ringtail lemur work. We support annual censuses at Berenti Reserve. We have for many years. We also have, we have that species here and red rough lemur conservation. We have a number of that, those critically endangered species here in Florida and we've supported a lot of field work. Uh, most recently, um, Monica Mogaleski's PhD was in a small part supported through work at LCF. And that's all in addition to our main home base in Sambava where we're one of the primary partners of Maro Jeji National Park and on John Harvey Seed Special Reserve. And I, I know when I visited before, uh, a part of your mission is to uh, work with lemurs that might be the underdogs in the zoo world, some that might be underrepresented in zoos. And, and we so much appreciate that. And also super impressed with um, the training programs we have there with students learning maybe how to track lemurs and work with lemurs in the field. Could you touch on how the college students learn about those programs? Yeah, we, we would actually love to have more field schools. And uh, so please um, sign up and uh, knock on my door if you're interested in teaching one. Um, we have a four or five that happen each year and they're very popular and they're rather affordable at, at our institution. Um, and um, we've had a number of people like Professor Linda Taylor has been so successful with her students becoming lemur professors and outstanding scientists like James Herrera, who Charlie mentioned. Um, I met James, um, one of the first places I met James was in Mayaka City at Linda's uh, field school, um, maybe 15 years ago. And uh, now look at him, so yeah. That's an incredible educational opportunity for students. So hopefully they'll check your website and uh, explore that more. And uh, our third panelist, Dr. Patricia Wright, it holds a, a very special place in my heart. Um, I met Patricia several decades ago and um, at our zoo. Uh, without our zoo, I would have never met uh, Dr. Wright. 
And she invited me after our brief encounter at our zoo to join her in Madagascar. And um, I will have some questions for Pat in a few minutes after her video, but um, I can't say enough how she is my champion. She's our champion of conservation of lemurs. And she has been a wonderful partner for Seneca Park Zoo. And I know Eric has worked with Pat as well. All of us have. She's um, an amazing collaborator. Let's uh, check out Pat's video and then uh, we'll uh, follow up with some questions. I'm Patricia Wright and I love lemurs. I love lemurs from the minute I saw them in the wilds of the rainforest of Madagascar almost 30 years ago. But when the timber the loggers began to take down the forest to make furniture and things like that, I was outraged. And I worked with the government to establish Ranabafan National Park to protect the 15 species of lemurs inside that park. <laughs> There's 110 different kinds of lemurs that are only found on Madagascar and 90% of the rainforest has been cut and the rest is in danger of being cut. Incredible creatures that live in these forests and those, those lemurs are only one of them. I love lemurs, I love following them, I love watching them jump. But I'm a research scientist and I established the Centerville Bio Research Station so that we could study them, study their genetics, their hormones, everything about them so that we can better protect them. And at this research station, we have 130 extraordinary local staff that work in the communities and work in the rainforest to help study and protect the lemurs. <laughs> Lemurs are wonderful. The National Park is wonderful. And I'm very grateful to you for helping us to protect these animals by participating in this extraordinary wildlife project. Thank you. <laughs> We could, we could speak over an hour with each of our panelists and uh, Pat, um, I'm sure our audience will have questions for you as well, but you know, we've, um, we've all learned your holistic approach, um, you know, integrating communities with impactful conservation programs. And there's a program that you're involved with that I'm not familiar with. It's maybe you could tell us about the WISE Tropics Project and Lemur Research Technicians. All right. Well, first of all, watching that film makes me very homesick. <laughs> it's, a, it's a terrible thing not to be able to go back to Madagascar because I started going to Madagascar 35 years ago. And this is the first time that it's been such a long time before I've actually seen a lemur. And so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very, uh, it's sad, but we learned how to make lemonade out of lemur, out of not lemurs, but lemon. So the, le the lemons, of course, are this a terrible coronavirus. Wise Tropics is a new NGO uh, that has been put together uh, to help our biodiversity techs because they are extraordinary local people who, when I met them, they didn't even have a third grade education. Now they're research scientists and they have an extraordinary ability to remember everything that's happened in these last 30 years. They know every individual lemur. 
And I really appreciate that long memory and I appreciate their loyalty to protecting nature. And so I put together uh, this fund uh, called Wise Tropics Incorporated so that they will continue to get uh, paid from uh, during this time of crisis. It's part of what, uh, what we've been doing. You see, when study abroad stops, and we have seven different study abroads, when the researchers don't come, when we have absolutely no income coming into our establishment, I mean, what do these people do? I mean, they have to live. And so, um, so we've been trying to gather together the funding to actually keep them going. And so that's what Wise, Wise Tropics is all about. But Madagascar and what's happening with the coronavirus, I'm sure you want to hear about that. I'm, I get up at five every morning and I'm talking to Benjamin and Day Day and all my Shafaka guides to be in close touch with the people there, even if I can't be there in person. And as you know, the numbers of the virus uh, has been, the number of people with the virus has been um, increasing every day. We were able to keep the virus at bay for the first like three months by doing isolation and quarantining and, and tracking. Uh, but in the last two weeks, we've suddenly, uh, the, the numbers have increased. Uh, we have to be very careful because most of those cases are in TANA. But, it, you know, it could escape from TANA at any time because the road from, um, from, from TANA to Ranamafan, it's 10 hours, but there's a road. <laughs> people can come down that road. Right now there's uh, a blockade where people are not allowed unless they have pepper, special permission. So that certainly helps. But I worry every day. It's like sitting on a powder keg. Now, the first thing we did is we, we tried our best to raise enough money so we didn't fire anybody. But, you know, you want people to be working if they're getting paid. We weren't allowed to go into the forest because the National Park Service was, was uh, closed off all the forest. And so we, we decided that we were going to take the bull by the horns there, weren't, there wasn't any PPE anywhere, but we started to make masks. And we made 10,000 masks. And, and we gave them away to the local people. We gave them away to the people in the villages. We started to make um, hand sanitizer. I mean, you know, hand sanitizer is mostly alcohol. We make pretty good alcohol in Ranamafan. <laughs> it's called Tokugasi. <laughs> so we went to the, the village that makes the best of all the alcohol, bought everything they had, and we transformed the drinking alcohol into non-drinking hand sanitizer. You know, just doing things like that. It really can, uh, it can, can make a difference when the, when the virus comes, but the Oscos can install a can-do kind of attitude because there's nothing worse than this virus because it's just everywhere and you don't know how to protect against it. Um, but if you do everything that you can, uh, at least you feel like you're doing something about it. Now you may ask, <laughs> about lemurs, because you know, we all love lemurs and we're very worried because some of those first studies that came out of the University of Calgary, Amanda Mellon, those first studies said that apes can get the COVID-19, old world monkeys can get COVID-19, new world monkeys don't seem to be able to, and some lemurs. And one of the lemurs was a shifaka, which is what I, of course, study and love. And so we, those are captive animals that they did the studies on. And we don't know right now, but we've just gotten a grant to be able to study um, lemur genetics. I don't know how much you know about the virus. You probably know more than I do, Jeff, but there's the ACE2 receptors. And that's what the problem is with the shafakas and the brown lemurs. They've got those receptors. They might be able to catch the, uh, the virus. 
luckily, you know how, how, how things happened. I was on the last plane out of Madagascar on March 20th, but one of my students didn't make that plane. <laughs> she was on a Fulbright and she is now at Centro Mobile. So she was just allowed by the National Park to go into the park and uh, collect feces so that she will be able to check on, on the, whether these animals in our park have the ACE2 receptors. So we're gonna have some answers soon. This is just, this is the latest news. This happened yesterday. <laughs> so, um, because it's very important for us. Why is it important? Well, we won't be able to go into the park if they can catch COVID and we can't let any tourists in because protecting the animals, you know, we have five critically endangered species. I mean, five critical, we have 15 species, five of them are critically endangered. So, you know, if COVID tears through a population, it could mean extinction. So we all have to be very careful. And, and Jeff, we were, we, we met a long time ago when Day Day came up to take uh, videos with Gertrude Houston. And everybody knows that I'm from Rochester. So this is my zoo, <laughs> at least when I was a kid. And it's in the first zoo in my heart. And it's, it was amazing what happened with that, just that one meeting. Because we've been working together, working together with your docents, working together all these years. And it's, it's just made such, an, a, I mean, it's amazing for our different programs. I mean, we do education, just like, like Eric, we do education and reforestation, and we do a little bit of environmental arts. We do, of course, research science uh, and reforestation. I mean, we've had so many projects that we've shared together. It's really great. And I'm very grateful to everybody at Seneca Park Zoo for, for their assistance through the years. But I'll tell you, there's never been a worse time than now. Ah, it's just, it's just not fair, is it? I mean, there's so many things happen to Madagascar. There's the cyclones and the poverty and the, and the, 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 the toxic toad that came over from Cambodia and all these things that have been problems for Madagascar, but this could be the worst. We have no funding from ecotourism and, and, uh, and everything is just really up in the air. But we could all talk about that a little bit. We've all got the same problems. You've, you've, um, you've so well demonstrated with all of your work how interconnected we are with the rest of the planet. All species, all people, all habitats, we're interconnected. And our, our globe is so small now with all of our international travel. We all know that COVID is a, is a, is an, a good example of how close we are and how at risk we are. I'm convinced that Pat, you, Eric, and Charlie, uh, you are pioneers using science to save species. And we need to really rely on science saving species like you've demonstrated by example and supporting research that is going to help us answer those questions uh, about COVID and lemurs and COVID and other species. We've seen in zoos now, interestingly, that some of our, our animals in zoos are also susceptible. So the more we, uh, we explore, I think the more we will learn how we are related and how we can help each other. I'd like to take the next uh, moment, but also to remind those participants from around the world here on our webinar that we uh, are accepting questions and Annie will be uh, presenting questions from our uh, participants. So please uh, bring in your questions because that will be um, coming soon. Uh, I would like to introduce a very good friend of mine, Darlene Benson, who is one of the, the founders of our strong docent conservation programming at Seneca Park Zoo. You know, we had a, uh, we had a, a nucleus of these docents that, uh, as I was directing the conservation programming at the zoo for many years, uh, if a docent comes up to you and says, this is a good idea to support, you know it is. They'll always do what the docents say. And, uh, and we have been following their lead for a long time. Hey, hey Darlene, uh, maybe you could give us a, a little information about, uh, about uh, why and how uh, Party Madagascar started 17 years ago. 
Oh, wow. Is it really 17 years? <laughs> yeah, oh, it sure fantastic. is. Fantastic. I remember that first one. Remember it, Darlene? Oh, absolutely. Yes, you were our guest speaker then. And um, and I think we ran into you because of Jeff, because you were working with Jeff already. Um, so the Dawson Conservation Committee uh, decided that we needed to do more work in the field. And um, as we looked around the zoo, we had so many... Um, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, remember this? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a wonderful so, photo. We were, yeah, so after a few years of, of having Party Madagascar, um, 10 of us were actually invited by Pat uh, to come to Madagascar. And we just had, of course, the most wonderful time um, exploring Rana Mafan and learning about the, you know, everything from the lemurs to the uh, giraffe beetles and uh, the birds and um, we spent a good I think two and a half weeks running going around Madagascar um, besides central Valbayo but we went to the west and south and and uh, certainly it made me even more anxious to help support uh, all the work that's being done there Darlene, I was, uh, I'm always impressed with the docents and how they impact our, our several hundred thousand visitors at Seneca Park Zoo. Could you comment about uh, your, um, your view on community-based conservation and inspiring our zoo visitors and how our zoo connected with these amazing uh, programs in the field uh, are, are saving lemurs in the wild? Um. <laughs> Well, of, of course, we always talk to the docents or to our guests about the animals that they're asking us questions about, but we also try and um, tell them more about how they can help with conservation and how important it is for not, not so much our animals at the zoo, but their um, counterparts out in the wild. And so we're always... Um, emphasizing that uh, they can help in so many ways, donating money or going to visit these places. It's just, um, so I've been a Joseph for 25 years and I've just enjoyed that so much. The zoo is such a powerhouse for education and inspiring people. And with these, uh, with these connections with field conservation, it makes us, uh, we all know, a more relevant saving animals in the wild. And uh, uh, hey, Pat, tell us a little bit about those pillowcases. Do you remember those? <laughs> Wonderful pillowcases. So what we do with our shivakas every year is we catch them to give them medical checkups and, uh, and to collar some of the animals that, uh, that are growing up and time for them to get a collar. And what I had asked Jeff, I said, Jeff, we don't really have anything. We have to, when we capture the animals, we have to put them in pillowcases but we they have to be you know breathable and you know and I was explaining this all to Jeff and so when when the uh, Seneca Park Zoo what they did was they sent us these special pillowcases I don't think the lemurs have ever been so <laughs> fancy they were absolutely beautiful and we used them and we used them, and they all now smell like lemur, <laughs> even after they've been washed many times. But I really thank you, because uh, it's, it's very important for us to learn about the health of the lemurs as, as well as with their behavior and ecology, what they're eating, you know, and, and all their social relationships. And uh, that's why we uh, involved Jeff. Uh, you know, he's a vet, and he's one of the best vets and he came and he helped us out and uh and and we're we very much uh, miss having you there maybe after this is all over and we can go back yes. into the forest again you'll come back you know i'll be back you know i'll be back we um we the docents um asked the uh, school children in rochester to make those pillowcases they traced around their hands and they actually started a pen pal project with uh students in uh madagascar in ranamafan uh, park area. 
it's just another wonderful connection with our community-based conservation and conservation in Madagascar. I think we have another slide with something delicious on the way. I want to remind everybody, this is a fundraiser and we are supporting such significant work in Madagascar, supporting our Seneca Park Zoo docents and our conservation programs directly supports saving lemurs in Madagascar. And these amazing scientists that we, uh, we couldn't do it without them. And we need our community to support these programs to save our wonderful lemurs and, and, and to realize how connected we are. So we have Stoneyard Brewing Company is, has a very special peach brew uh, that is available at the stores next week uh, described below. Pegadorns, One Stop, Steamers, 7-Eleven uh, East Main, AJ's, and Almonds. So uh, please, uh, those of you who happen to be in the Rochester area, support those. But also remember, we have a, a donation uh, web link uh, on, this, uh, on this program tonight. And you can go to Seneca Park Zoo, a website, and learn more about what is in store for us uh, over the weekend with an amazing marketplace of beautiful Malagasy craft work and also opportunities to most importantly, donate your dollars. It's what, it, dollars are what matter and what makes such an impact in these amazing programs, especially as we're seeing that these, uh, that these uh, COVID times have restricted uh, the economic support through uh, tourism. And also remember that with these 20, every $25 donation, we're, we're planting a tree in your honor. And it's all about trees. And once we reforest, reforest builds upon itself so it's more and more reforestation you can also shop the marketplace now and go to SenecaParkZoo.org and the party mad marketplace so check that out uh, support these wonderful scientists our docents who are championing these uh this this fundraising support we uh, uh do possibly have some questions annie from uh, the audience uh, maybe Annie could join us here and, uh, and uh, help us with some questions. We certainly, we have some good ones that came in. So I'm going to start off with a question from Susan. And she says, I'm interested in how the pandemic has impacted conservation projects in Madagascar. So we heard a little bit from Pat Wright about that. Um, but maybe Dr. Wyatt, Charlie, or Dr. Eric, you guys can chime in on, on your thoughts on how things have been during this pandemic. Eric, what would you, uh, how would you like to answer that? Um, uh, fortunately, the Saba region, the Northeast, uh, has not yet been severely impacted. Um, we have uh, recently restarted our family planning program. Uh, we buy a lot of, we bought 300 face masks the other day, which we distribute during the family planning program. However, Marojeji is still closed. And it's being, you know, uh, a lot of people are out of work due to the lack of tourism and the lack of researchers. So there are safeguards in place in your community and it sounds like uh, there's some restricted access that's actually protecting you. Yeah. But I, I would build on that a little bit too. That's, that's very lucky there, like Eric said, in the Sava region so far because it's an isolated region. But the number of cases in Madagascar of, of COVID coronavirus are going up really rapidly and, and the hospitals are full um, it's, it's extremely concerning and um, the, as Pat was talking about the, the impact on ecotourism of the country being, being shut down is, is huge. It's just a big hit to, to the government, to the local people and uh, it's a big hit to those, those local areas. Every protected area is, is, is having problems at some level with poaching or cutting of, of wood. And that's, that's not just limited to Madagascar. Madagascar is just a microcosm of what's going on in the rest of the undeveloped or developing world. These countries across Africa, this is, this is really gonna, gonna, gonna last for a long time, impact protected areas and wildlife and forests for a long time. Yeah, we know that impoverished communities with these desperate choices, uh, unfortunately, uh, have no choice but to uh, um, take from the, the resources locally in the, in the forest and uh, 
have the long-term consequences, but uh, it's about survival. And uh, we hope we can help uh, reverse that, reverse that poverty in any way we can. Pat, uh, we, we hear you're making face masks. So uh, do you have anything else you'd like to add about COVID before we take the next question? Yeah, I'd like to... I'd like to tell about the virtual wildlife projects that we have. I know Eric uh, spoke a little bit about them. We decided that we could bring tourists to Madagascar via Zoom, just like we're doing now. And uh, there were two people that got left behind in Madagascar, and the other one was Jesse Jordan. And Jesse Jordan is a communication person. And she has been working with the guides, with the tourist guides, to put on tours. And so there's a couple this weekend. If uh, you go on the Central Bio website, and I, they're really, they're really not David Attenborough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like every time I go on one of these tours, I mean, it's real Madagascar <laughs> and the wildlife is spectacular the 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 guides are spectacular and they're and you learn something new every time you go but it, it's very um it's it's very special so if any of you want to try out the tour what I did is I invited my whole family and so my family as a lot of you know are spread out all over the United States most of them are in Rochester but they're there's a couple in Elmira, and there's a couple more family in LA. And so I, I, uh, I invited them all to go on a tour to Madagascar. All my family hasn't been to Madagascar until then. Mm. You know, this allows kids to go. It allows, you know, people that just would never be able to afford to go to Madagascar to suddenly go on a wildlife tour. So I, I highly recommend it. I know uh, Eric's been doing it. I think all of us should, uh, should should try to do the best we can. It takes a lot of work. But we also may be opening up a new way to be able to to have a new audience, a bigger audience. So I think uh, putting on our thinking caps and trying to figure out how we can make this terrible tragedy into something um, something that is will make lemurs viable into the future. I think it's really important to do that. I don't know, we can't go into the National Park. So it isn't like you're going along with the guide and we're just having a video. We have to have a green screen in the back and then the guide has to, uh, it's very interactive. So you could stop the guide and say, wait, 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 I didn't see that, that, uh, that chameleon. Where, let's go, let, can, where is that chameleon? And then he can, you know, help you out. So it's, it is very interactive. So we have small groups of 10. And I think that's part of it is if you have a small group, you can get a lot of more interaction. But I don't want to take too much time, but I think virtual, virtual visits to the wildlife is something that we should develop with the Seneca Park Zoo. Yeah, I was just going to mention Annie. We uh, really should work on uh, having some links uh, to websites with these virtual tours and uh, really uh, take that on as, uh, as a novel way, a pioneering way to be impactful. That's a great, great suggestion, Pat. And maybe we could come up with some lemur, lemur smell too, just to bring it home. Pat, can you help <laughs> us with that? <laughs> Annie, do we have any uh, some other questions we might want to ask? We do, we have time for a couple more. We have a really good one that came in from James and I'm gonna summarize it a little bit here because it's a little bit on the long side. Um, but he brings up the good point that there are a few lemur species that are really prevalent throughout zoos and other conservation care areas like ring-tailed lemurs and rough lemurs. But there are a lot of other species of lemurs that aren't getting as much attention because they are not being kept in zoos where people can really have that great encounter with them um, outside of Madagascar. So he's asking, how can awareness of these species be raised to aid in their conservation too? I'll ask one of the scientists to comment on that. I defer okay. to Matt and Charlie. <laughs> um, well, that's, that's, that's a tough one, you know, certain, um, it's decided which species by, by AZA 
groups and, and committees which species or priority species to work with to concentrate on. So that does, by working with the more endangered species in captivity, there are by default some that get left off <laughs> um, that, that you don't see in zoos. And uh, I'm not sure how you, how you get around to, to educating people about those other species. It's, uh, that's, that's really challenging. I think you have to, at least with lemurs, to, that if you can can focus on at least family groups of lemurs and educating people about um, the larger groups in the sense of taxonomic families, um, you can at least give people an idea of, of what those lemurs are, are like, what their behaviors are, um, what their endangered status is in the wild and that sort of thing. And I don't I, know, I, Eric, Eric, do you have anything to add to that? Watch, watch Pat's film, Island of Lemurs, features yeah. the greater bamboo lemur and, and a number of other uh, very rare lemurs, which we don't get a close look, up, look at otherwise. Yeah. You know what I'd like to do at Seneca Park Zoo? I'd like to get sort of a, a camera going so that we could be there, you know, almost all of our lemurs aren't in zoos, the ones that are in Ranmafan National Park. So I think for all, you know, all three sites that are in Madagascar, I think we should start to do this webcam stuff. I think we should start to, you know, when, when we can get back there, uh, we can have uh, people reporting from the field. And I, and I think we should start to have li little videos where you're, if you know you have a whole bunch of kids and and maybe one wants to look at bamboo lemurs, then they can go in a special place and have a lot of information about bamboo lemurs. Or we can do it like once every week. There's a different lemur that's featured, but I think we're going to have to do it with videos, and we're going to have to do it in a way that they're not going to be. Well, oh, we got some charming videos. I mean, lemurs are so amazing, and there's so many different kinds. They're just crazy. And and that the website the and my website, I, I just put up one something where, you know, the brown lemurs, brown lemurs don't get much press, but brown lemurs are really smart and they're really cute. And the, this was taken in Ranmafan yesterday. And this brown me, uh, lemur mother is sitting there and the baby comes up and starts to hang on her tail. It must be really hurt because the baby is pretty big, almost the size of the mother. And she's playing with the tail and hanging on the tail. And suddenly the mother kind of flicks her off and she falls down. It's very humorous, as lemurs are. But I think we should, we should start to um, emphasize the fact that there's a lot of different kinds of lemurs and that the ones you see in Seneca Park are, are ambassadors, ambassadors for the others. Pat, you are hired. We are opening up, we know we're designing a, a Madagascar tropical complex. Wow, and so you're hired. What a good idea. We can really outreach into the wild through this wonderful new Madagascar tropical complex that the Zoo Society will be uh, uh, fundraising for. So you're hired. And you're right, we are focusing on ecosystem health. And so our representative lemurs are really ambassadors for all those other lemurs, as are the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds. You know, we have these signature species. They are representing the whole ecosystem and how we can coexist. So Pat, you're hired. Charlie, Eric, you too. We'll all work together and make this a, a wonderful Madagascar tropical complex. Annie, how are we doing on time? Do we have uh, more question opportunities? I think we have time for one more question. We are getting pretty close to the end here. Um, but I think this is a good one to kind of end our question session on. Katie is saying, if you had unlimited funds at this exact moment, what type of research projects would be your first priority? And I love that thought. Scientists. Yeah, unlimited funds. Whoa, <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> I think there's an awful lot we don't know about lemurs. I mean, Eric Patel has done some work with acoustics. We have, we don't know, we, and we know about the, the, the work that he's done, but there's so many other lemurs. We don't know what lemurs are saying to each other. And I think that's really important. We don't know about a lot of the health of lemurs. That's so important. 
we don't know about um, the, the interactions of the lemurs with their environment. After all these years and all these studies, there's still more to know. Uh, we've been working on the microbiome. You know, everybody's kind of trying to figure out what's going on in the guts and the immune system of lemurs. Lemurs are so special because they've got 60 million years of evolution. And they're so specialized, like the bamboo lemurs that only eat lemur. The lemur food is cyanide-filled bamboo shoots. I mean, crazy. And then we have the lepa lemurs that are only eating certain kinds of leaves. And then we have all the specialization. I, I think is really important for us to find out about because they are some of our close cousins. And I know we're all worried about the COVID virus, but there's a lot of diseases out there. And if we can understand how the lemurs are coping with these odd diets that they have and malaria things that they have that they have learned to cope with, if we can learn a lot more about the diseases of lemurs and, and how they uh, combat them, I, I really do think that we're going to get some insights into human health. So. Um, I would, if I were, if I had all the money in the world, I would just divide it amongst the, amongst us and let us go to work. There's so much to do. Yeah. That's awesome. Charlie, do you have a thought on that? Well, this, this is going to sound sort of odd and it's not very, very glamorous, but we've been working a lot on, as I said in the PowerPoint uh, presentation on sustainable agriculture, um, agroforestry, and, and you know, there's a lot of research that needs to be done into to how, how to get cultivators, farmers, um, using land in a way that's more sustainable so that less forest is, is, is cut. Tracking trees and doing corridors and and taking yeah. the forest back instead of, of always it, right. being on the defensive. Yeah, yeah, I, Charlie, you're absolutely right. We got to learn how to do better farming techniques. Yeah. Eric, uh, for lack of any other thoughts, try and support the Lemur Action Plan in full, which proposed ecotourism, promoting long-term research centers, and supporting community local guide associations. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Agree awesome. completely. Yes. Annie, I may have a closing question. Is it time to uh, wrap up with a closing question? We are just about done with our questions here. Um, I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to everybody's. We're going to try to get a little bit of a response into you um, typed over to you now. So Dr. Wyatt, go ahead and take it away with our closing question. So I would like to ask each of you um, awesome participants, our panelists, why should we have hope? Why should we have hope that we can restore, we can save our ecosystem? I've got one good thing I read recently. 12 Madagascar potchard um, small birds were born in November. And that was a bird that was believed to have been extinct Ugh. until recently. And that was a successful reintroduction done by Durrell. Quite a, quite a nice story, yeah. And from our side, the uh, populations of, of the golden bamboo lemur has doubled since we made that park. So, you know, uh, all you have to do is protect the forest, build more forests, and the lemurs will survive. Charlie. And I, I would say to come at that from a different angle is that, that we should have hope, we have to have hope. Madagascar is just too special. It's just the biodiversity there is, is, is too unique um, to, to risk losing. And, and of, of course, they're with the high levels of endemic species of both plants and animals. Once it's gone from there, it's, it's, it's gone from the planet. So it's, it's, it's something that we, we have to work on. We're not ever going to be able to have the success that we wish we could have. Um, but, but all of us working together can make a difference. We, we celebrate your successes. Uh, Eric, did you have another comment? No. We, we celebrate your successes and we are so honored to be able to support your work. 
uh, I'd like to uh, remind all of our participants around the world who are on this webinar that uh, we have a website that we are accepting donations. And please go to Seneca Park Zoo website. Uh, we're supporting all of this amazing work in Madagascar for many years. And it's more urgent now, especially with these tumultuous times with COVID. So please go to our website. Uh, please donate now. Uh, donate now to have a tree planted of all things and, and take ownership in that tree and more trees. And we can grow the forest, which will then sustain species far beyond lemurs and support an ecosystem. So I'd like to thank all of you for participating. I especially want to thank our Seneca Park Zoo docents who really uh, have been driving this program forward for 17 years. Your unstoppable Rochester community uh, couldn't have these conservation programs without you. We, we love you. You're all volunteers at Seneca Park Zoo. Uh, you re recruited conservation champions uh, for the future and also are inspiring all of the young people that visit the zoo. So thank you for what you do and thank you for supporting conservation with Party Mad. Thank all of you participants. Annie, do you have any closing comments? No, but thank you so much, Dr. Wyatt, for helping us with our events tonight. We do also have round two, if you didn't get enough tonight, like me. Um, at 10 o'clock in the morning tomorrow, we will have another moderator and another group of panelists. So if you just can't get enough of Party Mad, come and join us tomorrow morning also. And thank you guys so much all for attending today. We really appreciate the support. I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their evening. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.